Section fifteen of the Children of Odin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Children of Odin, the Book of Northern Myths, by Parik Kolum. Part three, the Witch's Heart. Chapter one, foreboding in Asgard. What happened afterwards is a shame to the gods, and mortals may hardly speak of it. Gulveig the witch came into Asgard, for Heimdall might not forbid her entrance. She came within, and she had her seat amongst the Aesir and the Vanir. She walked through Asgard with a smile upon her face, and where she walked and where she smiled, care and dire foreboding came. Those who felt the care and the foreboding most deeply were Bragi the poet and his wife, the fair and simple Iduna, who gathered the apples that kept age from the dwellers in Asgard. Bragi ceased to tell his never-ending tale. Then one day, overcome by the fear and the foreboding that was creeping through Asgard, Iduna slipped down Yggdrasil, the world tree, and no one was left to pluck the apples with which the Aesir and the Vanir stayed their youth. Then were all the dwellers in Asgard in sore dismay. Strength and beauty began to fade from all. Thor found it hard to lift Mjolnir, his great hammer, and the flesh under Freya's necklace lost its white radiance. And still Gulveig the witch walked smiling through Asgard, although now she was hated by all. It was Odin and Frey who went in search of Iduna. She would have been found and brought back without delay if Frey had had with him the magic sword that he bartered for Gerda. In his search he had to strive with one who guarded the lake wherein Iduna had hidden herself. Beli was the one he strove against. He overcame him in the end with a weapon made of stag's antlers. Ah, it was not then but later that Frey lamented the loss of his sword. It was when the riders of Muspel came against Asgard, and the Vanir, who might have prevailed, prevailed not because of the loss of Frey's sword. They found Iduna, and they brought her back. But still care and foreboding crept through Asgard, and it was known, too, that the witch Gulveig was changing the thoughts of the gods. At last Odin had to judge Gulveig. He judged her and decreed her death. And only Gunnir, the spear of Odin, might slay Gulveig, who was not of mortal race. Odin hurled Gunnir. The spear went through Gulveig, but still she stood smiling at the gods. A second time Odin hurled his spear, a second time Gunnir pierced the witch. She stood livid as one dead, but fell not down. A third time Odin hurled his spear, and now pierced for the third time, the witch gave a scream that made all Asgard shudder, and she fell in death on the ground. "'I have slain in these halls where slaying is forbidden,' Odin said. Take now the corpse of Gulveig and burn it on the ramparts, so that no trace of the witch who has troubled us will remain in Asgard. They brought the corpse of Gulveig the witch out on the ramparts, and they lighted fires under the pile on which they laid her, and they called upon Hreisfulger to fan up the flame. Hreisfulger is the giant who on heaven's edge sits in the guise of an eagle, and the winds, it is said, rush down on the earth from his outspreading pinions. Far away was Loki when all this was being done. Often now he went from Asgard, and his journeys were to look upon that wondrous treasure that had passed from the keeping of the dwarf Andvari. It was Gulveig who had kept the imagination of that treasure within his mind. Now when he came back and heard the whispers of what had been done, a rage flamed up within him. For Loki was one of those whose minds were being changed by the presence and the whispers of the witch Gulveig. His mind was being changed to hatred of the gods. Now he went to the place of Gulveig's burning. All her body was in ashes, but her heart had not been devoured by the flames. And Loki in his rage took the heart of the witch and ate it. Oh, black and direful was it in Asgard, the day that Loki ate the heart that the flames would not devour. CHAPTER Two, LOKI THE BETRAYER He stole Frigga's dress of falcon feathers. Then, as a falcon, he flew out of Asgard. Jotunheim was the place that he flew toward. 
The anger and the fierceness of the hawk was within Loki as he flew through the giant's realm. The heights and the chasms of that dread land made his spirits mount up like fire. He saw the whirlpools and the smoking mountains and had joy of these sights. Higher and higher he soared, until, looking toward the south, he saw the flaming land of Muspelheim. Higher and higher still he soared. With his falcon's eyes he saw the gleam of Surtur's flaming sword. All the fire of Muspelheim and all the gloom of Jotunheim would one day be brought against Asgard and against Midgard. But Loki was no longer dismayed to think of the ruin of Asgard's beauty and the ruin of Midgard's promise. He hovered around one of the dwellings in Jotunheim. Why had he come to it? Because he had seen two of the women of that dwelling, and the rage against the Asunir and the Vanir was such that the ugliness and the evil of these women was pleasing to him. He hovered before the open door of the giant's house, and he looked upon those who were within. Geriot, the most savage of all the giants, was there, and beside him, squatting on the ground, were his two evil and ugly daughters, Gjalp and Gripe. They were big and bulky, black and rugged, with horse's teeth and hair that was like horse's manes. Gjalp was the uglier of the two, if one could be said to be uglier than the other for her nose was a yard long, and her eyes were crooked. What were they talking about as they sat there, one scratching the other? Of Asgard and the dwellers in Asgard whom they hated. Thor was the one whom they hated most of all, and they were speaking of all they would like to do to him. "'I would keep Thor bound in chains,' said Gediot the giant, "'and I would beat him to death with my iron club. "'I would grind his bones to powder,' said Gripe. I would tear the flesh off his bones," said Gjalp. "'Father, can you not catch this Thor, and bring him to us alive?' "'Not so long as he has his hammer Mjolnir, and the gloves with which he grasps his hammer, and the belt that doubles his strength.' "'Oh, if we could catch him without his hammer and his belt and his gloves!' cried Gjalp and Gripe together. At that moment they saw the falcon hovering before the door. They were eager now for something to hold and torment, and so the hearts of the three became set upon catching the falcon. They did not stir from the place where they were sitting, but they called the child Glap, who was swinging from the roof-tree, and they bade him go out and try to catch the falcon. All concealed by the great leaves the child Glap climbed up the ivy that was around the door. The falcon came hovering near. Then Glap caught it by the wings and fell down through the ivy screaming and struggling as he was being beaten and clawed and torn by the wings and the talons and the beak of the falcon. Gediot and Gripe and Gjalp rushed out and kept hold of the falcon. As the giant held him in his hands and looked him over, he knew that this was no bird creature. The eyes showed him to be of Alfheim or Asgard. The giant took him and shut him in a box till he would speak. Soon he tapped at the closed box, and when Gediot opened it, Loki spoke to him. So glad was the savage giant to have one of the dwellers in Asgard in his power that he and his daughters did nothing but laugh and chuckle to each other for days. And all this time they left Loki in the closed box to waste with hunger. When they opened the box again Loki spoke to them. He told them he would do any injury to the dwellers in Asgard that would please them if they would let him go. "'Will you bring Thor to us?' said Gripe. Will you bring Thor to us without his hammer, and without the gloves with which he grasps his hammer, and without his belt?" said Gjalp. "'I will bring him to you if you will let me go,' Loki said. "'Thor is easily deceived, and I can bring him to you without his hammer and his belt and his gloves.' "'We will let you go, Loki,' said the giant, "'if you will swear by the gloom of Jotunheim that you will bring Thor to us as you say.' Loki swore that he would do so by the gloom of Jotunheim. Yea, and by the fires of Muspelheim," he added. The giant and his daughters let him go, and he flew back to Asgard. He restored to Frigga her falcon dress. All blamed him for having stolen it, but when he told how he had been shut up without food in Gediot's dwelling, those who judged him thought he had been punished enough for the theft. He spoke as before to the dwellers in Asgard, and the rage and hatred he had against them since he had eaten Gulveig's heart he kept from bursting forth. He talked to Thor of the adventures they had together in Jotunheim. 
Thor would now roar with laughter when he talked of the time when he went as a bride to Thrym the giant. Loki was able to persuade him to make another journey to Jotunheim. "'And I want to speak to you of what I saw in Gediot's dwelling,' he said. "'I saw there the hair of Sif, your wife.' "'The hair of Sif, my wife?' said Thor in surprise. "'Yes, the hair I once cut off from Sif's head,' said Loki. "'Gediot was the one who found it when I cast it away. They light their hall with Sif's hair. Oh, yes, they don't need torches where Sif's hair is.' "'I should like to see it,' said Thor. "'Then pay Gediot a visit,' Loki replied. "'But if you go to his house you will have to go without your hammer Mjolnir, and without your gloves and your belt.' "'Where will I leave Mjolnir and my gloves and my belt?' Thor asked. "'Leave them in Valaskjalf, Odin's own dwelling,' said cunning Loki. "'Leave them there and come to Gediot's dwelling. Surely you will be well treated there.' "'Yes, I will leave them in Valaskjalf and go with you to Gediot's dwelling,' Thor said. Thor left his hammer, his gloves, and his belt in Valaskjalf. Then he and Loki went toward Jotunheim. When they were near the end of their journey, they came to a wide river, and with a young giant whom they met on the bank, they began to ford it. Suddenly the river began to rise. Loki and the young giant would have been swept away, only Thor gripped both of them. Higher and higher the river rose, and rougher and rougher it became. Thor had to plant his feet firmly on the bottom, or he and the two he held would have been swept down by the flood. He struggled across, holding Loki and the young giant. A mountain ash grew out of the bank, and while the two held to him, he grasped it with his hands. The river rose still higher, but Thor was able to draw Loki and the young giant to the bank, and then he himself scrambled up on it. Now looking up the river he saw a sight that filled him with rage. A giantess was pouring a flood into it. This it was that was making the river rise and seethe. Thor pulled a rock out of the bank and hurled it at her. It struck her and flung her into the flood. Then she struggled out of the water and went yelping away. This giantess was Gjalp, Gediod's ugly and evil daughter. Nothing would do the young giant whom Thor had helped to cross but that the pair would go and visit Grid, his mother, who lived in a cave in the hillside. Loki would not go and was angered to hear that Thor thought of going. But Thor, seeing the giant youth was friendly, was willing enough to go to Grid's dwelling. "'Go, then, but get soon to Gediod's dwelling yonder. I will wait for you there,' said Loki. He watched Thor go up the hillside to Grid's cave. He waited until he saw Thor come back down the hillside and go toward Gediod's dwelling. He watched Thor go into the house where, as he thought, death awaited him. Then, in a madness for what he had done, Loki, with his head drawn down on his shoulders, started running like a bird along the ground. Grid, the old giantess, was seated on the floor of the cave grinding corn between two stones. "'Who is it?' she said, as her son led Thor within. "'One of the Aesir. What giant do you go to injure now, Asa Thor?' "'I go to injure no giant, old Grid,' Thor replied. "'Look upon me. Cannot you see that I have not Mjolnir, my mighty hammer, with me, nor my belt, nor my gloves of iron? But where in Jotunheim do you go? To the house of a friendly giant, old Grid, to the house of Gediod. Gediod, a friendly giant? You are out of your wits, Asa Thor. Is he not out of his wits, my son? This one who saved you from the flood, as you say? Tell him of Gediod, old mother, said the giant youth. Do not go to his house, Asa Thor, do not go to his house. My word has been given, and I should be a craven if I stayed away now, just because an old crone sitting at a quernstone tells me I am going into a trap. I will give you something that will help you, Asa Thor. Lucky for you I am mistress of magical things. Take this staff in your hands. It is a staff of power, and will stand you instead of Mjolnir. I will take it, since you offer it in kindness, old dame, this worm-eaten staff. And take these mittens, too. They will serve you for gauntlets of iron. I will take them, since you offer them in kindness, old dame, these worn old mittens. And take this length of string. It will serve you for your belt of prowess. I will take it, since you offer it in kindness, old dame, this ragged length of string. "'Tis well indeed for you, Asa Thor, that I am mistress of magical things.' Thor put the worn length of string around his waist, 
and as he did he knew that Grid, the old giantess, was indeed the mistress of magical things, for immediately he felt his strength augmented as when he put on his own belt of strength. He then drew on the mittens and took the staff that she gave him in his hands. He left the cave of Grid, the old giantess, and went to Gediot's dwelling. Loki was not there. It was then that Thor began to think that perhaps old Grid was right, and that a trap was being laid for him. No one was in the hall. He came out of the hall and into a great stone chamber, and he saw no one there either. But in the centre of the stone chamber there was a stone seat, and Thor went to it and seated himself upon it. No sooner was he seated than the chair flew upwards. Thor would have been crushed against the stone roof, only that he held his staff up. So great was the power in the staff, so great was the strength that the string around him gave, that the chair was thrust downward. The stone chair crashed down upon the stone floor. There were horrible screams from under it. Thor lifted up the seat and saw two ugly broken bodies there. The giant's daughters, Gjalp and Gripe, had hidden themselves under the chair to watch his death. But the stone that was to have crushed him against the ceiling had crushed them against the floor. Thor strode out of that chamber with his teeth set hard. A great fire was blazing in the hall, and standing beside that fire he saw Gediot, the long-armed giant. He held a tongs into the fire. As Thor came toward him he lifted up the tongs and flung from it a blazing wedge of iron. It whizzed straight toward Thor's forehead. Thor put up his hands and caught the blazing wedge of iron between the mittens that old Grid had given him. Quickly he hurled it back at Gediot. It struck the giant on the forehead and went blazing through him. Gediot crashed down into the fire, and the burning iron made a blaze all around him. And when Thor reached Grid's cave, he went there to restore to the old giantess the string, the mittens, and the staff of power she had given him. He saw the giant's dwelling in such a blaze that one would think the fires of Muspelheim were all around it. End of section 15 Section 16 of The Children of Odin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Children of Odin, The Book of Northern Myths, by Parik Colum. Part 3. Chapter 3. Loki against the Aesir. The Aesir were the guests of the Vanir. In Frey's palace the dwellers in Asgard met and feasted in friendship. Odin and Tyr were there. Vidar and Vali, Njord, Frey, Heimdall, and Bragi. The Sinjur and the Vana were also, Frigga, Freya, Iduna, Gerda, Skadi, Sif, and Nanna. Thor and Loki were not at the feast, for they had left Asgard together. In Frey's palace the vessels were of shining gold. They made light for the table, and they moved of their own accord to serve those who were feasting. All was peace and friendship there, until Loki entered the feast-hall. Frey, smiling a welcome, showed a bench to Loki. It was beside Bragi's and next to Freya's. Loki did not take the place. Instead he shouted out, "'Not beside Bragi will I sit. Not beside Bragi, the most craven of all the dwellers in Asgard.' Bragi sprang up at that affront, but his wife, the mild Iduna, quieted his anger. Freya turned to Loki and reproved him for speaking injurious words at a feast. "'Freya,' said Loki, "'why were you not so mild when Odur was with you? Would it not have been well to have been wifely with your husband, instead of breaking faith with him for the sake of a necklace that you craved of the giant women?' Amazement fell on all at the bitterness that was in Loki's words and looks. Tyr and Njord stood up from their seats. But then the voice of Odin was heard, and all was still for the words of the All-Father. "'Take the place beside Vidar, my silent son, O Loki,' said Odin, "'and let thy tongue which drips bitterness be silent. All the Aesir and the Vanir listen to thy words, O Odin, as if thou wert always wise and just,' Loki said. But must we forget that thou didst bring war into the world when thou didst fling thy spear at the envoys of the Vanir? And didst thou not permit me to work craftily on the one who built the wall around Asgard for a price? Thou dost speak, O Odin, and all the Aesir and the Vanir listen to thee. 
But was it not thou, who, thinking not of wisdom but of gold when a ransom had to be made, brought the witch Gulveig out of the cave where she stayed with the dwarf's treasure? Thou wert not always wise, nor always just, O Odin, and we at the table here need not listen to thee as if always thou wert. Then Skadi, the wife of Njord, flung words at Loki. She spoke with all the fierceness of her giant blood. Why should we not rise up and chase from the hall this chattering crow? she said. Skadi, said Loki, remember that the ransom for thy father's death has not yet been paid. Thou wert glad to snatch a husband instead of it. Remember who it was that killed thy giant father. It was I, Loki, and no ransom have I paid thee for it, although thou hast come amongst us in Asgard. Then Loki fixed his eyes on Frey, the giver of the feast, and all knew that with bitter words he was about to assail him. But Tyr, the brave swordsman, rose up and said, Not against Frey mayst thou speak, O Loki. Frey is generous. He is the one amongst us who spares the vanquished and frees the captive. Cease speaking, Tyr, said Loki. Thou mayst not always have a hand to hold that sword of thine. Remember this saying of mine in days to come. Frey, said he, because thou art the giver of the feast, they think I will not speak the truth about thee. But I am not to be bribed by a feast. Didst thou not send Skirnir to Gimer's dwelling to befool Gimer's flighty daughter? Didst thou not bribe him into frightening her into a marriage with thee, who, men say, wert the slayer of her brother? Yea, Frey. Thou didst part with a charge with the magic sword that thou shouldst have kept for the battle. Thou hadst cause to grieve when thou didst meet Belly by the lake." When he said this, all who were there of the Vanir rose up, their faces threatening Loki. "'Sit still, ye Vanir,' Loki railed. "'If the Aesir are to bear the brunt of Jotunheim's and Muspelheim's war upon Asgard, it was your part to be the first or the last on Vigard's plain. But already ye have lost the battle for Asgard, for the weapon that was put into Frey's hands he bartered for Gerda the giantess. Ha! Surtur shall triumph over you because of Frey's bewitchment." In horror they looked at the one who could let his hatred speak of Surtur's triumph. All would have laid hands on Loki, only Odin's voice rang out. Then another appeared at the entrance of the feasting hall. It was Thor. With his hammer upon his shoulder, his gloves of iron on his hands, and his belt of prowess around him, he stood marking Loki with wrathful eyes. "'Ha! Loki! Betrayer!' he shouted. "'Thou didst plan to leave me dead in Geriod's house, but now thou wilt meet death by the stroke of this hammer.' His hands were raised to hurl Mjolnir, but the words that Odin spoke were heard. "'Not in this hall may slaying be done, son Thor. Keep thy hands upon thy hammer." Then, shrinking from the wrath in the eyes of Thor, Loki passed out of the feast-hall. He went beyond the walls of Asgard, and crossed Bifrost, the rainbow bridge. And he cursed Bifrost, and longed to see the day when the armies of Muspelheim would break it down in their rush against Asgard. East of Midgard there was a place more evil than any region in Jotunheim. It was Jarnvid, the Iron Wood. There dwelt witches who were the most foul of all witches, and they had a queen over them, a hag, mother of many sons who took upon themselves the shape of wolves. Two of her sons were Skoll and Hati, who pursued Saul, the sun, and Mani, the moon. She had a third son, who was Managarm, the wolf who was to be filled with the life-blood of men, who was to swallow up the moon and stain the heavens and earth with blood. To Jarnvid, the iron wood, Loki made his way, and he wed one of the witches there, Angerboda, and they had children that took on dread shapes. Loki's offspring were the most terrible of the foes that were to come against the Aesir and the Vanir in the time that was called the Twilight of the Gods. Chapter 4 The Valkyrie Against the time when the riders of Muspelheim, with the giants and the evil powers of the underworld, would bring on battle, Odin Allfather was preparing a host of defenders for Asgard. They were not of the Aesir, nor of the Vanir. They were of the race of mortal men, heroes chosen from amongst the slain on fields of battle in Midgard. To choose the heroes, 
and to give victory to those he willed to have victory, Odin had battle-maidens that went to the fields of war. Beautiful were those battle-maidens and fearless. Wise were they also, for to them Odin showed the runes of wisdom. Valkyries, choosers of the slain, they were named. Those who were chosen on the fields of the slain were called in Asgard the Einherjar. For them Odin made ready a great hall. Valhalla, the hall of the slain, it was called. Five hundred and forty doors had Valhalla, and out of each door eight hundred champions might pass. Every day the champions put on their armor, and took their weapons down from the walls, and went forth and battled with each other. All who were wounded were made whole again, and in peace and goodly fellowship they sat down to the feast that Odin prepared for them. Odin himself sat with his champions, drinking wine, but eating no meat. For meat the champions ate the flesh of the boar Sirimnir. Every day the boar was killed and cooked, and every morning it was whole again. For drink they had the mead that was made from the milk of the goat Hydron, the goat that browsed on the leaves of the tree Liradir. And the Valkyries, the wise and fearless battle-maidens, went amongst them, filling up the drinking horns with the heady mead. Youngest of all the battle-maidens was Brynhild. Nevertheless, to her Odin All-Father had shown more of the runes of wisdom than he had shown to any of her sisters, and when the time came for Brynhild to journey down into Midgard, he gave her a swan-feather dress, such as he had given before to the three Valkyrie sisters, Alvit, Olrun, and Hladgrun. In the dazzling plumage of a swan the young battle-maiden flew down from Asgard. Not yet had she to go to the battlefields. Waters drew her, and as she waited on the will of the All-Father, she sought out a lake that had golden sands for its shore, and as a maiden bathed in it. Now there dwelt near this lake a young hero whose name was Agnar, and one day as Agnar lay by the lake he saw a swan with dazzling plumage fly down to it, and while she was in the reeds the swan-feather dress slipped off her, and Agnar beheld the swan change to a maiden. So bright was her hair, so strong and swift were all her movements, that he knew her for one of Odin's battle-maidens, for one of those who give victory and choose the slain. Very daring was Agnar and he set his mind upon capturing this battle-maiden, even though he should bring on himself the wrath of Odin by doing it. He hid the swan-feather dress that she had left in the reeds. When she came out of the water she might not fly away. Agnar gave back to her the swan-feather dress, but she had to promise that she would be his battle-maiden. And as they talked together, the young Valkyrie saw in him a hero that one from Asgard might help. Very brave and very noble was Agnar. Brynhild went with him as his battle-maiden, and she told him much from the runes of wisdom that she knew, and she showed him that the All-Father's last hope was in the bravery of the heroes of the earth. With the chosen from the slain for his champions, he would make battle in defense of Asgard. Always Brynhild was with Agnar's battalions. Above the battle she hovered, her bright hair and flashing battle-dress outshining the spears and swords and shields of the warriors. But the grey-beard King Helmgunnar made war on the young Agnar. Odin favoured the grey-beard king, and to him he promised the victory. Brynhild knew the will of the All-Father, but to Agnar, not to Helmgunnar, she gave the victory. Doomed was Brynhild on the instant she went against Odin's will. Never again might she come into Asgard. A mortal woman she was now, and the Norns began to spin the thread of her mortal destiny. Sorrowful was Odin All-Father that the wisest of his battle-maidens might never appear in Asgard, nor walk by the benches at the feasts of his champions in Valhalla. He rode down on Sleipnir, to where Brynhild was, and when he came before her it was his and not her head that was bowed down for she knew now that the world of men was paying a bitter price for the strength that Asgard would have in the last battle. The bravest and noblest were being taken from Midgard to fill up the ranks of Odin's champions. And Brynhild's heart was full of anger against the rulers of Asgard, and she cared no more to be of them. Odin looked on his unflinching battle-maiden, and he said, "'Is there aught thou wouldst have me bestow on thee in thy mortal life, Brynhild?' "'Naught save this.' Brynhild answered, that in my mortal life no one but a man without fear, the bravest hero in the world, may claim me for wife. 
Allfather bowed his head in thought. "'It shall be as thou hast asked,' he said. "'Only he who is without fear shall come near thee.' Then on the top of the mountain that is called Hindfell he had a hall built that faced the south. Ten dwarfs built it of black stone. And when the hall was built he put round it a wall of mounting and circling fire. More did Odin Allfather. He took a thorn of the tree of sleep, and he put it into the flesh of the battle-maiden. Then, with her helmet on her head, and the breast-mail of the Valkyrie upon her, he lifted Brynhild in his arms, and carried her through the wall of mounting and circling fire. He laid her upon the couch that was within the hall. There she would lie in slumber, until the hero who was without fear should ride through the flame and waken her to the life of a mortal woman. He took farewell of her, and he rode back to Asgard on Sleipnir. He might not foresee what fate would be hers as a mortal woman, but the fire he had left went mounting and circling around the hall that the dwarfs had built. For ages that fire would be a fence around where Brynhild, once a Valkyrie, lay in sleep. End of section 16 Section 17 of The Children of Odin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Children of Odin, The Book of Northern Myths, by Parik Kolum. Part 3. Chapter 5. The Children of Loki. The children of Loki and the witch Angerboda were not as the children of men. They were formless as water, or air, or fire is formless but it was given to each of them to take on the form that was most like to their own greed. Now the dwellers in Asgard knew that these powers of evil had been born into the world, and they thought it well that they should take on forms and appear before them in Asgard. So they sent one to Jarnvid, the iron wood, bidding Loki bring before the gods the powers born of him and the witch Angerboda. So Loki came into Asgard once more and his offspring took on forms and showed themselves to the gods. The first, whose greed was destruction, showed himself as a fearful wolf. Fenrir he was named. And the second, whose greed was slow destruction, showed itself as a serpent. Jormungand, it was called. The third, whose greed was for withering of all life, took on a form also. When the gods saw it they were affrighted. For this had the form of a woman, and one side of her was that of a living woman, and the other side of her was that of a corpse. Fear ran through Asgard as this form was revealed, and as the name that went with it, Hela, was uttered. Far out of sight of the gods Hela was thrust. Odin took her and hurled her down to the deeps that are below the world. He cast her down to Niflheim, where she took to herself power over the nine regions. There, in the place that is lowest of all, Hela reigns. Her hall is Elvidnir, it is set round with high walls, and it has barred gates. Precipice is the threshold of that hall, hunger is the table within it, care is the bed, and burning anguish is the hanging of the chamber. Thor laid hold upon Jormungand. He flung the serpent into the ocean that engirdles the world. But in the depths of the ocean Jormungand flourished. It grew and grew until it encircled the whole world, and men knew it as the Midgard serpent. Fenrir the wolf might not be seized upon by any of the Aesir. Fearfully he ranged through Asgard, and they were only able to bring him to the outer courts by promising to give him all the food he was able to eat. The Aesir shrank from feeding Fenrir, but Tyr, the brave swordsman, was willing to bring food to the wolf's lair. Every day he brought him huge provision, and fed him with the point of his sword. The wolf grew and grew, until he became monstrous and a terror in the minds of the dwellers in Asgard. At last the gods in council considered it, and decided that Fenrir must be bound. The chain that they would bind him with was called leading. In their own smithy the gods made it, and its weight was greater than Thor's hammer. Not by force could the gods get the fetter upon Fenrir. So they sent Skirnir, the servant of Frey, to beguile the wolf into letting it go upon him. Skirnir came to his lair and stood near him, and he was dwarfed by the wolf's monstrous size. "'How great may thy strength be, mighty one?' Skirnir asked. 
Couldst thou break this chain easily? The gods would try thee. In scorn Fenrir looked down on the fetter Skirnir dragged. In scorn he stood still, allowing leading to be placed upon him. Then, with an effort that was the least part of his strength, he stretched himself and broke the chain in two. The gods were dismayed. But they took more iron, and with greater fires and mightier hammer-blows they forged another fetter. Dromi, this one was called, and it was half again as strong as leading was. Skirnir the Venturesome brought it to the wolf's lair, and in scorn Fenrir let the mightier chain be placed upon him. He shook himself, and the chain held. Then his eyes became fiery, and he stretched himself with a growl and a snarl. Dromi broke across, and Fenrir stood looking balefully at Skirnir. The gods saw that no chain they could forge would bind Fenrir, and they fell more and more into fear of him. They took counsel again, and they bethought them of the wonder-work the dwarfs had made for them, the spear Gunnir, the ship Skidbladnir, the hammer Mjolnir. Could the dwarfs be got to make the fetter to bind Fenrir? If they would do it, the gods would add to their domain. Skirnir went down to Svartheim with the message from Asgard. The dwarf chief swelled with pride to think that it was left to them to make the fetter that would bind Fenrir. "'We dwarfs can make a fetter that will bind the wolf,' he said. "'Out of six things we will make it.' "'What are these six things?' Skirnir asked. "'The roots of stones, the breath of a fish, the beards of women, the noise made by the footfalls of cats, the sinews of bears, the spittle of a bird." I have never heard the noise made by a cat's footfall, nor have I seen the roots of stones, nor the beards of women. But use what things you will, O helper of the gods." The chief brought his six things together, and the dwarfs in their smithy worked for days and nights. They forged a fetter that was named Gleipnir. Smooth and soft as a silken string it was, Skirnir brought it to Asgard and put it into the hands of the gods. Then a day came when the gods said that once again they should try to put a fetter upon Fenrir. But if he was to be bound, they would bind him far from Asgard. Lingvi was an island that they often went to make sport, and they spoke of going there. Fenrir growled that he would go with them. He came and he sported in his own terrible way, and then as if it were to make more sport, one of the Aesir shook out the smooth cord and showed it to Fenrir. It is stronger than you might think, mighty one," they said. Will you not let it go upon you, that we may see you break it?" Fenrir, out of his fiery eyes, looked scorn upon them. "'What fame would there be for me,' he said, in breaking such a binding?" They showed him that none in their company might break it, slender as it was. "'Thou only art able to break it, mighty one,' they said. "'The cord is slender, but there may be an enchantment in it.' Fenrir said. "'Thou canst not break it, Fenrir, and we need not dread thee any more,' the gods said. Then was the wolf ravenous wroth, for he lived on the fear that he made in the minds of the gods. "'I am loath to have this binding upon me,' he said. "'But if one of the Aesir will put his hand in my mouth as a pledge that I shall be freed of it, I will let ye put it on me.' The gods looked wistfully at one another. It would be health to them all to have Fenrir bound, but who would lose his hand to have it done? One and then another of the Aesir stepped backward, but not Tyr, the brave swordsman. He stepped to Fenrir, and laid his left hand before those tremendous jaws. "'Not thy left hand, thy sword-hand, O Tyr,' growled Fenrir, and Tyr put his sword-hand into that terrible mouth. Then the cord Gleipnir was put upon Fenrir, with fiery eyes he watched the gods bind him. When the binding was on him, he stretched himself as before. He stretched himself to a monstrous size, but the binding did not break off him. Then with a fury he snapped his jaws upon the hand, and Tyr's hand, the swordsman's hand, was torn off. But Fenrir was bound. They fixed a mighty chain to the fetter, and they passed the chain through a hole they bored through a great rock. The monstrous wolf made terrible efforts to break loose, but the rock and the chain and the fetter held. Then, seeing him secured, and to avenge the loss of Tyr's hand, the gods took Tyr's sword and drove it to the hilt through his underjaw. Horribly the wolf howled, mightily the foam flowed down from his jaws. 
the foam flowing made a river that is called Vaughn, a river of fury, that flowed on until Ragnarok came, the twilight of the gods. End of section 17 Section 18 of The Children of Odin This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt The Children of Odin, The Book of Northern Myths by Parik Kolum Part 3 Chapter 6 Baldur's Doom In Asgard there were two places that meant strength and joy to the Aesir and the Vanir. One was the garden where grew the apples that Iduna gathered, and the other was the peace-stead, where, in a palace called Breidablik, Baldur the well-beloved dwelt. In the peace-stead no crime had ever been committed, no blood had ever been shed, no falseness had ever been spoken. Contentment came into the minds of all in Asgard when they thought upon this place. Ah, were it not that the peace-stead was there, happy with Baldur's presence, the minds of the Aesir and the Vanir might have become gloomy and stern from thinking on the direful things that were arrayed against them. Baldur was beautiful. So beautiful was he that all the white blossoms on the earth were called by his name. Baldur was happy. So happy was he that all the birds on the earth sang his name. So just and so wise was Baldur that the judgment he pronounced might never be altered. Nothing foul or unclean had ever come near where he had his dwelling. Tis Breidablik called, where Baldur the Fair hath built him a bower, in the land where I know least loathliness lies. Healing things were done in Baldur's stead. Tyr's wrist was healed of the wounds that Fenrir's fangs had made, and there Frey's mind became less troubled with the foreboding that Loki had filled it with when he railed at him about the bartering of his sword. Now, after Fenrir had been bound to the rock in the faraway island, the Aesir and the Vanir knew a while of contentment. They passed bright days in Baldur's stead, listening to the birds that made music there. And it was there that Bragi the poet wove into his never-ending story the tale of Thor's adventures amongst the giants. But even into Baldur's stead foreboding came. One day, little Hnosa, the child of Freya and the lost Odur, was brought there in such sorrow that no one outside could comfort her. Nanna, Baldur's gentle wife, took the child upon her lap and found ways of soothing her. Then Hinosa told of a dream that had filled her with fright. She had dreamt of Hela, the queen that is half-living woman and half-corpse. In her dream Hela had come into Asgard, saying, A lord of the Aesir I must have to dwell with me in my realm below the earth. Hinosa had such fear from this dream that she had fallen into a deep sorrow. A silence fell upon all when the dream of Hnosa was told. Nanna looked wistfully at Odin All-Father. And Odin, looking at Frigga, saw that a fear had entered her breast. He left the peace-stead and went to his watch-tower, Hlidskjalf. He waited there till Hugin and Munid should come to him. Every day his two ravens flew through the world, and coming back to him told him of all that was happening and now they might tell him of happenings that would let him guess if Hela had indeed turned her thoughts toward Asgard, or if she had the power to draw one down to her dismal abode. The ravens flew to him, and lighting one on each of his shoulders, told him of things that were being said up and down Yggdrasil, the world-tree. Ratatosk the squirrel was saying them, and Ratatosk had heard them from the brood of serpents that with Nidhogg, the great dragon, gnawed ever at the root of Yggdrasil. He told it to the eagle that sat ever on the topmost bough, that in Hela's habitation a bed was spread, and a chair was left empty for some lordly comer. And hearing this, Odin thought that it were better that Fenrir the wolf should rage ravenously through Asgard than that Hela should win one from amongst them to fill that chair and lie in that bed. He mounted Sleipnir, his eight-legged steed, and rode down toward the abodes of the dead. For three days and three nights of silence and darkness he journeyed on. Once one of the hounds of Helheim broke loose and bayed upon Sleipnir's tracks. For a day and night Garm, the hound, pursued them, and Odin smelled the blood that dripped from his monstrous jaws. At last he came to where, wrapped in their shrouds, 
a field of the dead lay. He dismounted from Sleipnir and called upon one to rise and speak with him. It was on Volva, a dead prophetess, he called. And when he pronounced her name, he uttered a rune that had the power to break the sleep of the dead. There was a groaning in the middle of where the shrouded ones lay. Then Odin cried out, Arise, Volva, prophetess. There was a stir in the middle of where the shrouded ones lay, and a head and shoulders were thrust up from amongst the dead. Who calls on Volva the prophetess? The rains have drenched my flesh, and the storms have shaken my bones for more seasons than the living know. No living voice has a right to call me from my sleep with the dead. It is Vegtam, the wanderer, who calls. For whom is the bed prepared and the seat left empty in Hela's habitation? For Baldur, Odin's son, is the bed prepared and the seat left empty. Now let me go back to my sleep with the dead." But now Odin saw beyond Volva's prophecy. "'Who is it,' he cried out, "'that stands with unbowed head and that will not lament for Baldur? Answer, Volva, prophetess. Thou seest far, but thou canst not see clearly. Thou art Odin. I can see clearly, but I cannot see far. Now let me go back to my sleep with the dead. Volva, prophetess, Odin cried out again. But the voice from amongst the shrouded ones said, Thou canst not wake me any more until the fires of Muspelheim blaze above my head. Then there was silence in the field of the dead, and Odin turned Sleipnir, his steed, and for four days, through the gloom and silence, he journeyed back to Asgard. Frigga had felt the fear that Odin had felt. She looked toward Baldur and the shade of Hela came between her and her son. But then she heard the birds sing in the peace-stead, and she knew that none of all the things in the world would injure Baldur. And to make it sure, she went to all the things that could hurt him, and from each of them she took an oath that it would not injure Baldur, the well-beloved. She took an oath from fire and from water, from iron and from all metals, from earths and stones and great trees, from birds and beasts and creeping things, from poisons and diseases. Very readily they all gave the oath that they would work no injury on Baldur. Then, when Frigga went back and told what she had accomplished, the gloom that had lain on Asgard lifted. Baldur would be spared to them. Hela might have a place prepared in her dark habitation, but neither fire nor water, nor iron nor any metals, nor earths, nor stones, nor great woods, nor birds, nor beasts, nor creeping things, nor poisons, nor diseases, would help her to bring him down. Hela has no arms to draw you to her, the Aesir and the Vanir cried to Baldur. Hope was renewed for them, and they made games to honour Baldur. They had him stand in the peace-stead, and they brought against him all the things that had sworn to leave him hurtless. And neither the battle-axe flung full at him, nor the stone out of the sling, nor the burning brand, nor the deluge of water would injure the beloved of Asgard. The Aesir and the Vanir laughed joyously to see these things fall harmlessly from him, while a throng came to join them in the games, dwarfs and friendly giants. But Loki the hater came in with that throng. He watched the games from afar. He saw the missiles and the weapons being flung, and he saw Baldur stand smiling and happy under the strokes of metal and stones and great woods. He wondered at the sight but he knew that he might not ask the meaning of it from the ones who knew him. He changed his shape into that of an old woman, and he went amongst these who were making sport for Baldur. He spoke to dwarfs and friendly giants. "'Go to Frigga and ask! Go to Frigga and ask!' was all the answer Loki got from any of them. Then to Fenselir, Frigga's mansion, Loki went. He told those in the mansion that he was Groa, the old enchantress who was drawing out of Thor's head the fragments of a grindstone that a giant's throw had embedded in it. Frigga knew about Groa, and she praised the enchantress for what she had done. "'Many fragments of the great grindstone have I taken out of Thor's head by the charms, I know,' said the pretended Groa. Thor was so grateful that he brought back to me the husband that he once had carried off to the end of the earth. So overjoyed was I to find my husband restored that I forgot the rest of the charms, and I left some fragments of the stone in Thor's head." So Loki said, repeating a story that was true. "'Now I remember the rest of the charm,' he said, 
and I can draw out the fragments of the stone that are left. But will you not tell me, O Queen, what is the meaning of the extraordinary things I saw the Aesir and the Vanir doing? I will tell you, said Frigga, looking kindly and happily at the pretended old woman. They are hurling all manner of heavy and dangerous things at Baldur, my beloved son, and all Asgard cheers to see that neither metal nor stone nor great wood will hurt him. But why will they not hurt him? said the pretended enchantress. "'Because I have drawn an oath from all dangerous and threatening things to leave Baldur hurtless,' said Frigga. "'From all things, lady? Is there no thing in all the world that has not taken an oath to leave Baldur hurtless?' "'Well, indeed, there is one thing that has not taken the oath, but that thing is so small and weak that I passed it by without taking thought of it.' "'What can it be, lady?' "'The mistletoe, that is without root or strength. It grows on the eastern side of Valhalla, I passed it by without drawing an oath from it. Surely you were not wrong to pass it by? What could the mistletoe, the rootless mistletoe, do against Baldur? Saying this, the pretended enchantress hobbled off. But not far did the pretender go hobbling. He changed his gait and hurried to the eastern side of Valhalla. There a great oak tree flourished, and out of a branch of it a little bush of mistletoe grew. Loki broke off a spray and with it in his hand he went to where the Aesir and the Vanir were still playing games to honour Baldur. All were laughing as Loki drew near, for the giants and the dwarfs, the Asinir and the Vana, were all casting missiles. The giants threw too far, and the dwarfs could not throw far enough, while the Asinir and the Vana threw far and wide of the mark. In the midst of all that glee and gamesomeness it was strange to see one standing joyless. But so he stood, and he was of the Aesir, Chodur, Baldur's blind brother. "'Why do you not enter the game?' said Loki to him in his changed voice. "'I have no missile to throw at Baldur,' Chodur said. "'Take this and throw it,' said Loki. "'It is a twig of the mistletoe.' "'I cannot see to throw it,' said Chodur. "'I will guide your hand,' said Loki. He put the twig of mistletoe in Chodur's hand, and he guided the hand for the throw. The twig flew toward Baldur. It struck him on the breast, and it pierced him. Then Baldur fell down with a deep groan. The Aesir and the Vanir, the dwarfs and the friendly giants, stood still in doubt and fear and amazement. Loki slipped away, and blind Hodur, from whose hand the twig of mistletoe had gone, stood quiet, not knowing that his throw had bereft Baldur of life. Then a wailing rose around the peace-stead. It was from the Asunir and the Vana. Baldur was dead, and they began to lament him. And while they were lamenting him, the beloved of Asgard, Odin, came amongst them. "'Hela has won our Baldur from us,' Odin said to Frigga, as they both bent over the body of their beloved son. "'Nay, I will not say it,' Frigga said. When the Aesir and the Vanir had won their senses back, the mother of Baldur went amongst them. Who amongst you would win my love and good will? she said. Whoever would let him ride down to Hela's dark realm and ask the queen to take ransom for Baldur? It may be she will take it and let Baldur come back to us. Who amongst you will go? Odin's steed is ready for the journey. Then forth stepped Hermod the nimble, the brother of Baldur. He mounted Sleipnir and turned the eight-legged steed down toward Hela's dark realm. For nine days and nine nights Hermod rode on. His way was through rugged glens, one deeper and darker than the other. He came to the river that is called Gjol, and to the bridge across it that is all glittering with gold. The pale maid who guards the bridge spoke to him. "'The hue of life is still on thee,' said Modgudur, the pale maid. "'Why dost thou journey down to Hela's deathly realm?' "'I am Hermod,' he said and I go to see if Hela will take ransom for Baldur. "'Fearful is Hela's habitation for one to come to,' said Modgudur, the pale maid. "'All round it it is a steep wall that even thy steed might hardly leap. Its threshold is precipice. The bed therein is care, the table is hunger, the hanging of the chamber is burning anguish.' "'It may be that Hela will take ransom for Baldur. "'If all things in the world still lament for Baldur, Hela will have to take ransom and let him go from her," said Modgudur, 
the pale maid that guards the glittering bridge. It is well, then, for all things lament Baldur. I will go to her, and make her take ransom. Thou mayst not pass until it is of a surety that all things still lament him. Go back to the world and make sure. If thou dost come to this glittering bridge and tell me that all things still lament Baldur, I will let thee pass, and Hela will have to hearken to thee. I will come back to thee, and thou, Modgudur, pale maid, will have to let me pass. Then I will let thee pass," said Modgudur. Joyously Hermod turned Sleipnir and rode back through the rugged glens, each one less gloomy than the other. He reached the upper world, and saw that all things were still lamenting for Baldur. Joyously Hermod rode onward. He met the Vanir in the middle of the world, and he told them the happy tidings. Then Hermod and the Vanir went through the world, seeking out each thing and finding that each thing still wept for Baldur. But one day Hermod came upon a crow that was sitting on the dead branch of a tree. The crow made no lament as he came near. She rose up and flew away, and Hermod followed her to make sure that she lamented for Baldur. He lost sight of her near a cave, and then before the cave he saw a hag with blackened teeth who raised no voice of lament. "'If thou art the crow that came flying here, make lament for Baldur,' Hermod said. "'I, Thaukt, will make no lament for Baldur,' the hag said. "'Let Hela keep what she holds.' "'All things weep tears for Baldur,' Hermod said. "'I will weep dry tears for him,' said the hag. She hobbled into her cave, and as Hermod followed, a crow fluttered out. He knew that this was Thaukt, the evil hag, transformed. He followed her, and she went through the world, croaking, "'Let Hela keep what she holds! Let Hela keep what she holds!' Then Hermod knew that he might not ride to Hela's habitation. All things knew that there was one thing in the world that would not lament for Baldur. The Vanir came back to him, and with head bowed over Sleipnir's mane, Hermod rode into Asgard. Now the Aesir and the Vanir, knowing that no ransom would be taken for Baldur, and that the joy and content of Asgard were gone indeed, made ready his body for the burning. First they covered Baldur's body with a rich robe, and each left beside it his most precious possession. Then they all took leave of him, kissing him upon the brow. But Nanna, his gentle wife, flung herself on his dead breast, and her heart broke, and she died of grief. Then did the Aesir and the Vanir weep afresh, and they took the body of Nanna, and they placed it side by side with Baldur's. On his own great ship, Ringhorn, would Baldur be placed with Nanna beside him. Then the ship would be launched on the water, and all would be burned with fire. But it was found that none of the Aesir or the Vanir were able to launch Baldur's great ship. Hirokin, a giantess, was sent for. She came mounted on a great wolf with twisted serpents for a bridle. Four giants held fast the wolf when she alighted. She came to the ship, and with a single push she sent it into the sea. The rollers struck out fire as the ship dashed across them. Then when it rode the water, fires mounted on the ship. And in the blaze of the fires one was seen bending over the body of Baldur and whispering into his ear. It was Odin, All-Father. Then he went down off the ship, and all the fires rose into a mighty burning. Speechlessly the Aesir and the Vanir watched with tears streaming down their faces, while all things lamented, crying, Baldur, the beautiful, is dead, is dead. And what was it that Odin Allfather whispered to Baldur as he bent above him, with the flames of the burning ship around? He whispered of a heaven above Asgard that Surtur's flames might not reach, and of a life that would come to beauty again, after the world of men and the world of the gods had been searched through and through with fire. End of section 18 Section 19 of The Children of Odin This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt The Children of Odin, The Book of Northern Myths by Parik Kolum. Part Three, Chapter Seven. Loki's punishment. The crow went flying toward the north, croaking as she flew, "Let Hela keep what she holds. 
Let Hella keep what she holds. That crow was the hag Thaukt transformed, and the hag Thaukt was Loki. He flew to the north and came into the wastes of Jotunheim. As a crow he lived there, hiding himself from the wrath of the gods. He told the giants that the time had come for them to build the ship Nagelfar, the ship that was to be built out of the nails of dead men, and that was to sail to Asgard on the day of Ragnarok, with the giant Hrymer steering it. And hearkening to what he said, the giants then and there began to build Nagelfar, the ship that gods and men wished to remain unbuilt for long. Then Loki, tiring of the wastes of Jotunheim, flew to the burning south. As a lizard he lived amongst the rocks of Muspelheim, and he made the fire-giants rejoice when he told them of the loss of Frey's sword and of Tyr's right hand. But still in Asgard there was one who wept for Loki, Siguna, his wife. Although he had left her and had shown his hatred for her, Siguna wept for her evil husband. He left Muspelheim as he had left Jotunheim, and he came to live in the world of men. He knew that he had now come into a place where the wrath of the gods might find him, and so he made plans to be ever ready for escape. He had come to the river, where, ages before, he had slain the otter that was the son of the enchanter, and on the very rock where the otter had eaten the salmon on the day of his killing, Loki built his house. He made four doors to it so that he might see in every direction, and the power that he kept for himself was the power of transforming himself into a salmon. Often as a salmon he swam in the river, but even for the fishes that swam beside him Loki had hatred. Out of flax and yarn he wove a net that men might have the means of taking them out of the water. The wrath that the gods had against Loki did not pass away. It was he who, as Thaukt the hag, had given Hela the power to keep Baldur unransomed. It was he who had put into Hodur's hand the sprig of mistletoe that had bereft Baldur of life. Empty was Asgard now that Baldur lived no more in the peace-stead, and stern and gloomy grew the minds of the Aesir and the Vanir, with thinking on the direful things that were arrayed against them. Odin in his hall of Valhalla thought only of the ways by which he could bring heroes to him to be his help in defending Asgard. The gods searched through the world, and they found at last the place where Loki had made his dwelling. He was weaving the net to take fishes when he saw them coming from four directions. He threw the net into the fire so that it was burnt, and he sprang into the river and transformed himself into a salmon. When the gods entered his dwelling they found only the burnt-out fire. But there was one amongst them who could understand all that he saw. In the ashes were the marks of the burnt net, and he knew that these were the tracing of something to catch fishes, and from the marks left in the ashes he made a net that was the same as the one Loki had burnt. With it in their hands the gods went down the river dragging the net through the water. Loki was affrighted to find the thing of his own weaving brought against him. He lay between two stones at the bottom of the river, and the net passed over him. But the gods knew that the net had touched something at the bottom. They fastened weights to it, and they dragged the net through the river again. Loki knew that he might not escape it this time, and he rose in the water and swam toward the sea. The gods caught sight of him as he leaped over a waterfall. They followed him, dragging the net. Thor waited behind, ready to seize him, should he turn back. Loki came out at the mouth of the river, and behold, there was a great eagle hovering over the waves of the sea and ready to swoop down on fishes. He turned back in the river. He made a leap that took him over the net that the gods were dragging. But Thor was behind the net, and he caught the salmon in his powerful hands, and he held him, for all the struggle that Loki made. No fish had ever struggled so before. Loki got himself free all but his tail, but Thor held to the tail, and brought him amongst the rocks, and forced him to take on his proper form. He was in the hands of those whose wrath was strong against him. They brought him to a cavern, and they bound him to three sharp-pointed rocks. With cords that were made of the sinews of wolves they bound him, and they transformed the cords into iron bands. There they would have left Loki bound and helpless. But Skadi, with her fierce giant blood, was not content that he should be left untormented. She found a serpent that had deadly venom, and she hung this serpent above Loki's head. The drops of venom fell upon him, bringing him anguish drop by drop, minute by minute. So Loki's torture went on. But Siguna with the pitying heart came to his relief. She exiled herself from Asgard, 
and endured the darkness and the cold of the cavern, that she might take some of the torment away from him who was her husband. Over Loki Siguna stood, holding in her hands a cup into which fell the serpent's venom, thus sparing him from the full measure of anguish. Now and then Siguna had to turn aside to spill out the flowing cup, and then the drops of venom fell upon Loki, and he screamed in agony, twisting in his bonds. It was then that men felt the earth quake. There in his bonds Loki stayed, until the coming of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. End of Part 3 End of Section 19